What's up, everyone? My name's Dave. Uh, I work at Tyco Labs. And I'm going to be talking about the Tyco ZK EVM. And I hope that you guys can think about the security aspects and, and developing an Ethereum equivalent ZK rollup like Tyco. And um, yeah, so let's get right into it. So the topics that I'm going to talk about is, first of all, defining security. Um, I think user education is really important. Also, I do like developer experience, so I want to get some, you know, a good grounding on the technology, on the terminology for security. Then I'm gonna do a quick overview of Tyco and um, what it is and, and how it looks, because I think some of the details, especially it being fully decentralized, um, introduces different security um, aspects that we need to think about. And then I'm gonna talk about where should users be careful, and then how we can improve security. Come on. Okay. Um, <laughs> see here. Hmm. Okay. Nice. Um, cool. So um, yeah, these are just some ideas that I thought of in terms of defining security. So like, you know, I th I think if you looked up just the dictionary definition of security, it would be something that's related to like safety. Like, do you feel relatively safe with your funds um, and things like that? Um, but one thing that I like to think about, and I think it's really a really important responsibility of people in the blockchain space, is that we have a really user-centric mindset. So the user is going to have certain assumptions about the system that they're using. They might think that the bridge is safe to use. They might think that their contract will execute um, in a in a particular way. So when you fail to meet those assumptions that the user has about the system, your system is pretty much insecure, at least from their perspective, which I think is the most important. Um, so yeah, trustless and trust minimized. I just wanted to put these buzzwords here because I don't love the word trustless. Um, I know that um, it's a kind of well understood thing. It means we're not trusting like a central authority. But I think to a lot of users, when they hear like trustless bridge or something like that, they just instantly think that it's totally safe to use and that there's no, there, there's no, there's no issues. But we're going to see there's a whole bunch of trust assumptions in ZK rollups, even Ethereum equivalent ones. And it's important to educate the user on, on these things. So I like to use uh, some more specific words, like for example, permissionless. Um, I think it's a better word than trustless to describe the ability for anyone to just enter into a system. Um, I also like using the word trust minimized because it encourages us to say, okay, what are the trust assumptions to the users? And list them out. Okay, you need to make sure that the proof is valid. Um, so how do we do that? And we'll, we'll, go, we'll go more into those details later, but I think it's very important we get these terminologies right. I don't know how to use this clicker, honestly. But here, okay. I'm trying out here. <laughs> I might need some help, or I don't know. Okay, so background of Tyco? Sure, okay. Yeah, so I'll go quick through this. Um, like I said, Tyco is like kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> one of the people in our org said something funny, like Tyco is not aiming to be your first ZK EVM, but your last one. And I think it's illustrative of what we're trying to do. Um, security is our number one uh, principle. It's what we prioritize more than anything. Um, so it's not as important for us to come and bring the scale first. Um, it's the same value that Ethereum has. Like security is the number one for us. Um, so yeah, we're also working on this community ZKEVM effort with the Ethereum Foundation. Um, Scroll is helping out with it as well. And basically this initiative by the EF is to prove Ethereum blocks as is, like L1 Ethereum blocks. And that's what this initiative is and we're working on it and it's the ZKEVM that we'll use for our protocol because we prove um, Ethereum blocks as is and we don't change anything about them. Um, so yeah, we released an Alpha 1 testnet. Uh, Matt talked a little bit about it. Um, it uh, it was really cool, fully decentralized proposers, and we have an Alpha 2 testnet coming soon, which has fully decentralized prover network. Um, okay, so what do we inherit from Ethereum? So, like I said, I do like developer experience, so you need to think about, like, okay, what does a smart contract developer have to end up doing? So they write some code in Solidity, and they have some bytecode, and they need to deploy that bytecode somewhere. They send it to some RPC, which is pointing to some Ethereum L1 node. So it's really boring as well what you end up doing on Tyco. You just take that compiled bytecode, and you send it to a layer 2 RPC. That's it. So but we're promising something a little bit further than EVM equivalents. So we'll say that, like, okay, we... We, we, st we support all the standard opcodes, all the standard precompiles, but we don't just execute all of those things with full compatibility. We execute them in the same way. 
So the, all of the um, gas costs for those opcodes, the way that the, the state trees are built in the execution client are all equivalent as well. Um, what, one other thing that we inherit from Ethereum are some validity rules from the yellow paper, which defines um, what a valid transaction looks like. Um, some fairly simple stuff, like what's the account balance, the nonce, et cetera. But Ethereum defines very well what um, a valid transaction looks like um, in order to uh, make a state transition. Um, okay, yeah, we're decentralized, open source, like, yeah, MIT license, and yeah, it's just like everything about the protocol is, is on our GitHub, so. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that Tyco is really a platform more um, for building. And, and that's another thing I think we inherit from Ethereum. If you think of our bridge, for example, our bridge is really just built on top of Tyco. So Tyco is really just a platform to build things in this Ethereum equivalent uh, ZK rollup environment. Okay. I'm going to try to go through this quick, but I, I, I want to at least give a high level overview of how Tyco sort of works. Um, if you want more info, just reach out and like talk to me after and we can go into it. So we have users over here. I think you said I had a laser pointer, but whatever. Um, they submit transactions to proposers. These are all decentralized as well. Like it's just a whole network of our community. And they end up proposing a block. So we said that we inherit those validity rules that Ethereum has, like, and, and we use those before proposing a block. So the interesting thing is, is the moment that the transaction data is posted to Ethereum L1, the, 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 the L2 state is deterministic. We, we can already compute the state from that point because the validity is very well defined. So it's not necessarily finalized, but it has a sense of finality once that's been posted to that L1 contract instantly. And, um, Anyone can build the roll-up state, and and that's the that's going to be the most useful and like practical um, thing for the user actually. So yeah, we propose these blocks, cool, and then we got these provers on the side. They're also decentralized. They're coming in and they're taking the little blue squares and they're proving them. Okay, so a proof is really just proving a state transition, like from one state from one block hash to another one, but it needs to come. The, if you see, there's a third one here, which is, which is the, the, the yellow box. And the reason we have that is because although you prove a block hash is transitioned to the next one, that parent also needs to have had a successful uh, um, transition all the way back to Genesis. So um, we have this parallel proving. They just go around. Provers are like, all right, let's find these proposed blocks. They're proving them in parallel. They're all green. And then once it changes, once it has a, a, a previous parent, which has been verified, instantly they're all... Um, proven or like verified and, and ready to withdraw so um, yeah and like I said uh, you can just build the roll-up state it's all on Ethereum L1 and it's deterministic cool so where should users be careful let's see here um, placing trust of course is the big one like um, with uh, bridges I think a lot of the community is moving towards these more trustless bridges uh, uh, which are built on smart contracts um, another one is that we talked about in the panel is this idea of the permissioned override slash upgrade. So of course this is something we need um, in, in case there's a bug in the proof or something like that, but it's something we need to be careful about, uh, especially users, right? Like if I were a user, I would just kind of want to look through the smart contracts and like Alex said, like it can be immutable or upgradable. I would want to know, okay, what's upgradable? And that would be a really good metric for how permissionless it really is. Um, correctness. Um, this kind of just goes into like how I was saying, it's not really, there's a lot of trust assumptions. So yeah, there's, there could be a bug in the proof system. There could be a bug in the client even, right? Like um, we say that we reuse uh, the Go Ethereum client, an execution client, but that could also have a bug. Like that's why Ethereum on L1 diversifies its clients as well. So we, you, you're also susceptible to this kind of risk if you don't have a good amount of diversity. So it's something we also uh, think about as well. Um, it, like Alex also said, like we, we, having that two factor, like two different ways of doing something is a really good way to improve security by a large factor. And last thing I want users to think about is, like, is, the, is the context of a rollup. Because 
things are different and there's new actors that are involved here. You're, especially with a decentralized one like Tyco, you're not interacting, although you're interacting with Geth clients, they're, they're different. They don't have um, the same, they're not running like a consensus client, for example, and, and there's just differences that you need to keep aware here, right? In Ethereum, you have pretty high trust that the network is lively, that you're always gonna be able to communicate um, with a node. If you don't have the right incentive structures on uh, L2, then that might not be the case. So it, it's something you need to think about as well as a user, this, this liveliness. And, and, I, and I think the, the incentive structure um, of bringing proposers to propose blocks and bringing provers in is, is a really important thing uh, for users to consider. Um, and then how can we improve user security? Um, so these are some of my personal ideas that, uh, like I said, I'm really into like education. I love those um, little extensions that just show you if you're on like a phishing site or if there's something that's gone wrong because, um, yeah, I, I, I think, like I said, w when you think about like a trustless bridge, it's like, okay, maybe on some levels it is, but there's all, there's all of these different levels you have to think about. Like, is your user using a phished website? Like, that's, th that's a part of it as well. Um, a part of the security. So I think education is really important. Obviously, we really want users to be able to do things themselves. Um, you know, let's say for a bridge, right? It's like, if you can run a node on the L2, um, then and you can obviously post um, data to L1, then you can just do the bridge yourself. You don't even need to rely on any centralized uh, proposer or anything. Um, you can just do it yourself, and I think that's really empowering. Uh, last one is governance. and. Like I said, I think you, uh, Ethereum is user centric. Decentralized rollups should be user centric. It's not owned by like a certain, it's owned by the community really and all of the node runners. Um, and then the last point I just wanted to make here was about diversity and collaboration. Um, like we said, um, we want to have like multiple proof systems. Also, kind of multiple clients like we do on Ethereum. This kind of diversity is really, honestly, better than I think, like we want audits as well, but this kind of security is really, really good because the probability of there being a bug in both of these systems is much smaller. Um, so having diversity in implementation is really good. Even having diversity in protocols is really good because it challenges us to come up with new ideas and do things in a better way. So we should, you know, the little you know, back and forth kind of things I think is really good to have this, this level of diversity. But what is important is, is if you think about diversity, um, um, for the example of like an execution client, right? There's several different implementations of it, like there might be different implementations of a rollup, but there's one spec, right? There's an execution client spec that they all adhered to. And in the same way, it would be great if rollups did the same thing. Like we could have differences in the way there are di like implementations and, and uh, different kind of things to enable that diversity, but I think it's really important we have neutral interfaces. Um, for example, things like L2Beat, which is not like tied to a specific rollup, but it just goes through and the user can be like, okay, these are the different like mechanisms. This is an optimistic rollup, this is a ZK rollup. And they can just use these primitives which are well understood by the whole space. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the last thing I thought was important. I kind of sped run that because I thought I didn't have that much time, but feel free to follow us on Twitter read the documentation, complain about it. I, I wrote most of it uh, on the website. Um, the slides are there. Um, yeah, um, that's about all that I had. Thank you very much.